Okay, hey everyone, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this talk is about MEV and Ethereum. So either you probably already know what MEV is, uh, or if you don't, that's okay. We'll cover and give like a small example. And then I'm gonna talk about a lot of stuff uh, just right outside the protocol and it's interplay between say like the actual core protocol and all the applications we built on top of it. It turns out at least to some like pretty wild stuff. Uh, so yeah, what is this thing MEV? Again, many of you have probably heard of it. Uh, if not, so, you know, it sort of used to be an acronym and kind of still is. Uh, originally, it stood for Minor Extractable Value. And the idea was, you know, we have miners of the protocol. They're the ones who are, like, determining consensus and making the blocks. And it turns out that when you go to make a block, to add a block in the chain, uh, this miner actor had this, like, complete freedom to take whatever traction uh, transactions they saw in the mempool and put them into a block however they chose right um and it turns out that when you have this freedom to have uh you know the ability to include transactions exclude transactions or reorder them uh it has implications especially for blockchains like ethereum which have this like very rich stateless so you know now we're in this like proof of stake world we've gotten rid of these miners so now we still have this acronym and people have tried to come up with different names like maximal extractable value or something like this Either way, we can just call it a BB. Um, and yeah, it's again this this ability of a block producer to choose the exact sequence of transactions. If you're familiar with like layer two stuff, I think there have been some talks, you know, even throughout this weekend about that. Everyone talks about the sequencer actor, and it's again this this uh, agent in these protocols that's selecting how these transactions actually are sequenced in the chain and like the history that we all agreed to. So, you know, how could it really matter? Maybe if you just think about it, like, let's just say we have a few, like, ether sends from, like, you to me to you to you, then, like, you know, why does it really matter and what are they happening? Um, but here's an example where the matter orders a lot. So uh, you'll hear this a lot in this, like, niche of the space called sandwiches. Uh, and the idea is that you have a transaction, some, like, quote, victim transaction, and another transaction after. And so this is where the sequence is important. So the place this comes up is with, say, Uniswap, a decentralized exchange. Uh, you have a pool for these two tokens, say, ETH, USDC, and ETH. And let's just say, for example, the price in this pool is 1656, uh, meaning that many, like, USDC tokens to get one ETH back. Uh, and that's basically what you want to do. You're like, okay, this looks good to me, so I tell Uniswap, hey, I want to do this. Uh, along with that, I have to tell Uniswap, hey, uh, there's this other thing called a slippage that I'll accept. And here it's, like, half a percent. Uh, the idea is that by the time I look at the pool and am um, able to transact against it, the price may have changed a little bit. And this is just because, like, there's this, like, fundamental discrepancy between when I see the chain and, you know, when I can interact with it. Because, again, we have this, like, open permissionless network. Uh, it's changing all the time, honestly, and all sorts of things are happening. So uh, in order to do this and use Uniswap, you need to, you know, have some, some tolerance here. This is called the slippage. And, for example, saying half a percent means... You know, I would like to only pay like the 1656, but worst case, I'd pay half a, per half a percent more, right? The 1664 number. Is there? Oh, uh, I was looking for a laser pointer, but either way, uh, this number over here. And yeah, you know, sort of in our, our happy default case, we're the only ones interacting with Uniswap, and so we get that price and we're happy. The problem, though, is that kind of as I laid out, there's time in between like when I might see this price and when I'm able to actually execute the trade, right? So like, let's say everyone in this room wants to make the same trade, but the way that these blockchains work today is like there's a single sequence where like we have to go in some serial order. And so, you know, that's part of this problem is having this block producer figure out what that sequence is. So let's say then, uh, you know, half of us trade before we can you know give it to this price that i had here and so what that means is that the the price in the pool will move against us so now we can see where this idea of an attack comes from because what you do is basically you see a trade with a lot of slippage you say okay i want to basically front run it so i get in front of it and i drive up the price uh against the user up to their slippage right so if this uh, transaction accepted half a percent, then basically I drive the price up, you know, just under the 1664. And then their trade will still go through, but at the worst possible execution. And then as an attacker, I can turn around and immediately sell the tokens I just bought at the higher price and I'm guaranteed profit. Uh, 
yeah so you do this front run victim transaction back run that's the sandwich and yeah so again like the reason why this is here in the first place is because otherwise you like couldn't use uniswap like you'd basically have to say you know not having slippage is kind of identical to setting it to zero but if you go do that almost certainly you're you know almost all your trades if not all of them are just going to to revert they won't go through because again it's like too precise between when you make the trade and when the you know trade can be settled that being said it also opens up this mev situation which you know at least in this situation we like got a worse execution so that's not good so what do we do about that um and this is just one example there's many of these basically you know i'd say pretty much every on-chain interaction like exposes some, some sort of mev uh then the question becomes what do you do about it and that's actually a very uh active r d topic as we'll kind of get since we're in, in the rest of this talk it opens up this whole design space for mevaware you know ways of thinking about how we design the protocol both consensus and execution layers how we think about applications how they interact with each other layer one layer two the the whole the whole space honestly um yeah so that's like mev kind of broadly and we'll kind of zoom in a bit to like ethereum specifically and this is more or less the picture today uh this is the transaction supply chain as we've come to call it uh put together first by the ghost up and we see sort of these like boxes with these like uh types of actors they'll have very like important and different roles going from i'm a user who wants to like make a transaction say you know i want to trade some tokens all the way to a validator and proof of stake ethereum where they're actually the ones making the blocks that determine you know what happens on chain so we'll just walk through you have a user they have some intent like again i want to swap my usdc for eth uh, they usually then will use like wallet software metamask something like this uh, and that will author a transaction transactions go into like a public or even these days private mempool and there uh, we have entities called searchers and searchers jobs are basically to like find these like different strategies they have so for example like a sandwich strategy is one type uh, you could have a different one for example you could specialize in liquidations you could say oh like here's a cdp and maker and uh you know it's suddenly under collateralized i need to go liquidate it for like the health of the system and yeah side note uh that should just show us that like not all mev is necessarily bad there's like good mev because it keeps our protocols healthy um and kind of points to this bigger picture of having this whole design space of again just programming with these types of incentives so searchers are the ones who are uh you know collecting extracting this mev depending on how you look at it or the example uh, the way they do this is having bundles. And so a bundle is, again, just like a, you know, stack of transactions. Again, with our sandwich example, you would have my trade, if I'm being sandwiched, the front run and the back run. And that's like the bundle. That then goes to a builder. Builders are kind of like searchers. They basically specialize in just making complete blocks versus having like one or two specific MEV strategies that they specialize in. So builders build blocks, which they then need to hand off to validators. Already this picture is getting more complicated. Uh, this diagram was put out around the time of the merge for proof of stake Ethereum. Uh, I updated this today actually, cause it's uh, again, already getting a little more complex. You've probably heard of ERC 4337. This is account abstraction. Uh, it's been a pretty hot topic. The idea here is that rather than me as a user go to make sort of raw Ethereum transactions that go on chain, I can now have this thing called a user operation, a user op. And the idea is that uh, rather than like use the chain directly, I can abstract what I want to do uh, and basically use the full sort of power of the EVM to determine how my intent or operation, again, the, the language here gets a little blurry, but I want to do something. And then now I have the full power of the EVM to like program how that thing can happen. Um, yeah. So now you have users talking to wallets. Uh, they might make transactions. They could also then, for example, if you're if you have a smart contract wallet, they'd make these user ops. There's now another actor called a bundler in the 437 world that's then collecting the user operations. They make their own bundles, 437 bundles, which go into transactions that then would go to builders or validators. There's a bunch of other arrows, just not even on here. It quickly gets very hairy, uh, but yeah. Point is, things are getting uh, complicated quickly. And it keeps going. So uh, 437 adds like something to the picture there's, uh, I think, a pretty frontier research uh, sort of direction right now is thinking about an order flow auction. So, you know, if you have this picture, 
where users are like trying to use the chain and there's already all this like infrastructure infrastructure in the middle people want to think about ways to like auction off these these have been essentially rights to like uh execute these different user intents and you know one way we thought about this is just you know literally having an auction uh now we have another actor here like a solver in an ofa if you've heard of CalSwap, this is kind of essentially the idea um yeah and as you can probably guess you know it just keeps getting more and more complicated every day of course you know this is just at one layer of the stack you could have this at layer two so you have to think about all of this in that context uh then basically for each different sort of box or like column you could have uh centralized or decentralized components so yeah it quickly gets complicated <laughs> so uh there's a lot going on and yeah the bottom line is uh there's almost this like intrinsic thing happening when we go to use blockchains the way we make them today and like that thing just like naturally has this consequence of mev and it turns out that you know so mev kind of is always there and moreover it's this like centralizing force this is where it starts to be very problematic especially for our core protocol uh you know it's very important for ethereum to be decentralized and like have all these properties that follow from that and the thing with mev is that again it's directly sort of opposing that decentralization goal the reason why is because if i'm over here and like basically any of these players here uh if i'm a little bit better at like using this mev at someone else's disadvantage in this picture then i could basically make this flywheel or now i just get better and better and better i just like have reasons either because i can like directly directly subsidize usage or something like this but basically i can become more and more of a like entren uh, entrenched established player here and what that means is now it's harming the centralization of like this whole network so that's not good and recognizing this we can say okay well yeah this is like messy chaotic picture uh what can we directly do is like we can make sure that like the core protocol itself is actually you know retain some decentralization and the way we're going to do that is basically just putting this firewall in place between the validators of the core protocol and all this other stuff this is what we call PBS, Proposer Builder Separation. Again, if you follow this, you've probably heard that term thrown around. And again, the idea is basically saying, okay, can we think about how to remove these centralization tendencies from this whole picture, uh, at least from this one part of the stack? What this picture does really is just push them up the stack. And so we haven't really solved the problem, just moved it somewhere else, but we can at least keep this part good. And that gives us more breathing room to like think about this other part. Right. So that being said, uh, I haven't even really said what how PBS work. I've just claimed it's a thing we can do. And it turns out there's like a very large design space around it. And we also do want to be thoughtful about how we actually roll it out, especially if we like enshrine anything in the core protocol. So that means that a similar sort of enshrined PBS is probably some years away. Uh, at least it's not anything going to happen, you know, super soon. And so what can we do in the meantime? Well, we can essentially do off-chain PBS. And you've heard of MapBoost, or if you have, then that's uh, exactly what MapBoost attempts to do, is implement PBS in this off-chain fashion. Uh, yeah, again, this is like a whole different talk, but it's just like calling out some of these different parts again of like looking at this picture and saying if there's all these different players, you know, they're gonna, you know, some of them today are relatively immature because they kind of have just come onto the scene. So the are maturing and, you know, like the builder market and searcher market, I think are already quite sophisticated, um, but it's only probably going to get like more sophisticated from here. So there's all sorts of things you can do. Uh, you know, you can think about more in the user part of things. Like, can we actually, rather than just like leak the MEV to like other parts of the stack, can we capture it and actually internalize it back to the user? So like, for example, if I make my Uniswap trade, is there some way to like, you know, capture that slippage value that otherwise I would have left to someone else? Um, and you could imagine that even flowing directly back to me in the form of a rebate. So it's almost like I get paid to trade. That's pretty nice. Uh, 437 is happening. That opens, again, a whole other layer to this. Uh, and then generally, you can ask these same questions, like, for applications broadly, the protocol broadly. Can we minimize MEV? Can we capture it to use it somehow? Um, all sorts of fun things like this. So uh, the rest of this will be focused on PBS and what that means for the core protocol. Um, today that means MetBoost, tomorrow some sort of enshrined PBS, and let's look at what that is. 
So in case you haven't heard, what is MetBoost? It's an off-chain implementation of PBS, uh, stewarded by Flashbots. They're like a big um, MEV R&D firm in the space. Again, if you've heard of MEV, you've probably heard of Flashbots. Along with many other researchers and developers in the Ethereum community, uh, there's a link here if you want to just check out a place to get started. And okay, so we'll step back a second and say like, how are we going to actually implement this PBS thing? Uh, if we want to like build MevBoost to do this, like what are we really saying? Like at the highest level of abstraction, we have proposers, the ones, these validators who are actually minting blocks of the chain. We have builders who are doing all this other stuff upstream of that. And the core problem here is that proposers want to like sell their block space, right? They want to just sell like what actually happens in this, uh, you know, the execution part of their block, which is this little question mark thing down here. And uh, builders ultimately, they want to like buy that from them, right? So already we have this market. We have people who want to sell something. If you want to buy something, uh, markets are a great way to like structure that problem, a solution to that problem. And so, yeah, what I try to do with this graphic is like have a chain of blocks. So this is the blockchain. Uh, if you are familiar with this part, there's like a consensus layer, an execution layer after the merge, right? So there's now kind of two parts here. The consensus block is the blue part. Inside we have this execution payload. And I try to communicate like the fact that some execution payloads have more or less MEV by this like golden border here. And what this means is that you have this chain of blocks, you come to the next block in the chain the proposer wants to build and the question is like, well, what do they do here? This is where they could then think about outsourcing that to one of these builder actors. So now we have a network of block builders, again, who want to like buy block space, a network of proposers who want to sell block space, the validators here. And yeah, the question is like, how do we connect them? And that's essentially what Mebus does is provide this, this market, this abstraction for them to do so. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a bit overloaded because we use it to refer to like the whole thing. So it's like this network to like structure this exchange I just described. It's also like all the software to actually do the thing. So ultimately, like if you are a solo sticker at home, you might run MevBoost. That means you have this like sidecar thing, this middleware that sits next to your setup and facilitates this MEV buying and selling. And ultimately what it does is just construct this again rendezvous. So it, like, it lets for each slot that a proposer has them connect to this network of builders and says, okay, you know, as a block builder, I can bid for uh, this, this block. And, you know, it's a way for me to tell you what my bid is. And yeah, the naive thing here is you basically as a builder, just send your block over. The project says, great, I'll pick like the highest bid, for example, and carry on. So that's basically what this says, right? It's just like, if I don't worry about any sort of attacks or anything, I can do exactly that. I can imagine like, uh, as a proposer, I just know where all the builders are because they told me ahead of time. Every slot I say, hey, give me your best block. They do so. If I'm revenue maximizing, I'll pick the most valuable one, the one with the highest bid, select that one and move on. So there's a catch though, which is that uh, it can't be that simple. <laughs> So Ethereum, right, we want to have, again, this very decentralized broad validator set. Um, that could even mean you have, like, you know, quite anonymous actors uh, who actually might try to, like, grief this mechanism, meaning they might try to, like, uh, do this to, like, take advantage of a builder, something like this. So because we do want to support, you know, all sort of uh, types of validators that show up, uh, we don't want to have some, like, trusted, like, whitelist, for example, or something like this to say you can access this network. We want to have it such that anyone can use it. And this leads to a problem because the way this usually works is, okay, as a builder, I'm working with all the searchers I was talking about. Searchers would then basically bid for inclusion in the block. Builders make a block. They then have a bid to the proposer. And usually that looks like some sort of like, you know, even just a, a neat send within the block to the proposer. And, you know, it's a little bit less than the value of, say, what the searchers bid. That's like the builder's compensation. And again, there's like a whole supply chain here. So what happens though is as a validator, I could just take the payload I'm given in the construction I've given so far. I could just take the payload and I could say, hey, this is a great block, you know, but you're taking your like 10% share. What if I just take that for myself? Uh, which right now everything says sort of in plain text so I can see that and I can do so. And that's what this is trying to demonstrate, this MEV stealing, where the honest exchange would be on the left you know this uh builder i called debbie cafe they get like some marginal sort of tip for their work the proposer maybe gets most of the value 
but that's okay. The attack here is that the proposer says, well, actually, I want all of it, and in fact, I'll just leave you none, and that's not great, um, because again, we need it to be, we need the mechanism to have integrity on like both sides with proposer and builders, otherwise no one will use it, and we won't be able to have this nice like firewall thing to prevent this like centralization flywheel that I pointed out earlier. So it's important that this is, again, has integrity, it's a sound construction that people actually want to use. So we have this problem of stealing. Well, how are we going to fix it? So again, just like at a very high level, you either uh, only let trusted actors who like promise they're going to say, hey, I'm never going to do this ever, TM. <laughs> you only let honest actors uh, play this game, have access to this market, or you, you know, somehow change it such that they don't really have to give you a promise because they just simply can't do the this sort of attack in the first place. And that's essentially, you know, what uh, MevBoost does is it says, okay, we're going to add in this like additional round of communication and have this sort of commit reveal game. Uh, what that means is that as a builder, I'm going to send over a commitment to the block. And then the proser has to accept it in a binding fashion before I reveal the whole block. And um, yeah, that I love less what's happening. Here's a little cartoon of this. So the, the intuition is that I've made my payload as a builder, but it's blinded somehow. That's why I give the proposer. Uh, it turns out that we can essentially use like the slashing security of the validator set. Uh, so the proposer signs this. They make their whole block that they would want to put on chain. They can sign this and bind them to it up to a slashing penalty. That then is given as proof to the builder that the proposer has bound themselves to this block. And once they've done that, they know it's safe to reveal. And so they reveal the unbinded, unblinded block, which the proposer then proposes and actually to the rest of the network. So you can't steal the MVP. And then just to make it clear, the reason why is because uh, the proposer has bound themselves again up to slashing uh, to use this specific, this one specific block, you know, that includes the builder payments and all that, uh, and it, it couldn't use any other one. So this last bit though, at the very end here, where the builder has to reveal a block, we kind of have like address the first problem and now have another which is that uh builders now are trusted to reveal the block and if they don't they could then grieve proposers this is like a common theme with this pbs stuff is that you know there's a design and you like have some holes so you try to patch the hole and then there's like another hole somewhere else and it just uh goes back and forth but all that being said uh, i called it here this availability attack and the idea is that uh, essentially i can like have you sign this thing but then i can just not give it to you and the reason that's a problem is because if I don't give you the full block, well, there's nothing for you to propose. So then you just like, you know, lost out on the chance to propose the whole block. So the current way we get around this is with this actor called a relay. And uh, basically the relay is like this trusted party that is going to do a couple things. They're going to make sure that like builders are sending valid blocks. They're going to like be this nice rendezvous point for proposers and builders. And importantly, they are going to ensure they're going to act as these like availability oracles. They're guaranteeing that uh, the payloads will be available if the proposer and holds up their part of the deal. So now, again, we like silo some of this trust and the relay, but it means that then with respect to proposers and builders on either side of the abstraction, they don't need to be trusted at all. And yeah, an important point here is you have many competing relays. So like, it's not great to have this like centralized trusted component, but you could have many of them and competition usually helps uh, with a lot of the problems that you get from having any centralization in the first place. So putting it all together, this is kind of what it ends up looking like. Uh, you have many builders. Again, there's like ideally lots of competition in this builder market. And that, for example, makes uh, makes censorship type things harder because, you know, I could basically like undercut you as a competing builder if uh, I see you're some doing something that is like censoring, something like this. Relays too, the same argument applies, the more the merrier. Uh, MevBoost is like, in this picture, these are like different, the, blo the, like the, the blocks are these different software components. So you have MevBoost sitting there and it's for the validator orchestrating this communication to like all these relays. And then they're in turn talking to all these builders. And this is the whole picture. So now we'll look at some data. Uh, again, this design ship with the merge uh, to get ready for proof of stake Ethereum. And yeah, these, okay, these actually all just came from today. So it's pretty recent. 
this website, mevboost.org, is pretty cool. It has like a lot of cool uh, stats on there. This is just from the header, basically showing within the last 24 hours, 80% of the network has uh, used this thing, which is like massive. <laughs> um, it's that like, if anything, this number is low simply because Chappelle just happened, the, the latest hard fork. And so some operators haven't like updated their nodes completely. But uh, yeah, usually the number is like much higher than this. So it's a very important part of the network now. Uh, it calls out Flashbot's dominance. So Flashbot is this, this firm I pointed out. Um, they used to have much higher dominance. We'll get to that in a second with these graphs at the bottom. But uh, so it's good to see that's pretty low in relative terms. And yeah, then we see this just counts how many relays have been active. Again, we're at 10. And again, the more the merrier here. So looks pretty healthy. Um, and again, these are charts from mevboost.pix, another good website to call out. And basically they're saying uh, this is like the relay market on the left. And we see that it started originally with Flashbots basically doing the whole thing. Uh, and then over time, other players entered the scene. In particular, like the ultrasound relay, this orange blob that's grown um, has really stepped up. And yeah, Agnostic's in there. You can look at the list. Bottom line is uh, you already see the market is like having more interest, starting to mature, and that's really exciting. Then on the right here, uh, it's a similar story for builders, where again, you see originally uh this this like big orange strip is flashbots and that was again to kind of bootstrap or seed the markets give other players time to come and like gain some of their share which you see with all the other colors coming out um and yeah i mean it could always be better but it's basically went from one player to now like many players so it's uh definitely trending in the right direction and just to like drive the point home this was from march 20th uh so a few weeks ago and this is definitely an outlier, <laughs> but uh, this was a payment for some MEV block of, you know, almost 700 ETH, which is a bunch of money. It's even more now. Uh, this actually went into like the LIDO pool. Uh, so good for them. But yeah, I mean, the point being is uh, people are using this thing and uh, it's, you know, quite serious. So, okay, we have this problem. Uh, we have this like solution for at least the short term of a boost. And it seems to be working, so like we're good, right? And uh, no. So basically, <laughs> uh, we had again, like I kind of called out the fact that we have this really actor, and it's now trusted in this in this game. And uh, it turns out that just like is is uh, already showing some problems. So for one, we have censorship of the relays. So a lot of the relays, you know, I showed you this uh, picture over here with this like graph on the left. Maybe there's like ten people here in the market. A lot of them are essentially following uh, various like legal uh, mandates in their jurisdiction, which, uh, you know, they should. <laughs> but that being said, what it implies here is that um, some relays are straight up censoring some transactions, which really goes against this, this idea, at least, of having layer one censorship resistance. Um, this is a graph. This is off mevwatch.info. Again, I'm trying to share a lot of like really cool websites. People have been looking at this stuff very deeply. And mevwatch.info, um, this is showing uh, which blocks are OFAC compliant. So this is like referring to uh, this like legal ruling that a lot of people are following right now in the space. And that being said, you can see this like green blob has gotten much bigger. So uh, again, to the extent that we need censorship resistance, you know, that's trending in the right direction. And yeah, but it's kind of just like ultimately a uh, consequence of this model that like this happened in the first place. So ideally, we would like to maybe even remove the relay so that this is just not even a relevant concern. Uh, again, okay, so I'll have to explain this. This happened, what, I think two weeks ago, Sandwich the Ripper, there was like a pretty big mev boost attack or hack you might have heard about. And really what happened was, again, sort of a flaw with this relay system. And, you know, I'm not claiming that some enshrined PBS would have made this perfect, but the fact that there's like, again, there's like, 10, you know, a small number of very centralized actors uh, that are, you know, good targets, uh, honeypots, we can say, that doesn't help the problem. So what happened? Um, yeah, so this is actually very clever. So basically, there is more or less a bug in the real implementation where when I go to do this exchange that I was trying to show way back here. So uh, the way that we do this blinding is by sending over a header 
not the full block, just a header of the block. The proposer signs the header, and that is then basically binding them to this particular payload. And then uh, they release the full block. So basically, what was happening is that relays were not validating that this blue part was actually a valid block. And so what that meant is that uh, I could hand over a signature that would look valid for an invalid consensus block, and then release the payload. And the reason this is a problem is because now the relay actually doesn't have a valid block, so they can't, uh, you know, tell everyone else that the proposer already signed this thing. And the proposer, who's rogue in the situation, has the block. They can pull off one of these map stealing attacks, this thing here, and that's exactly what happened. So, and it was, <laughs> the reason this one was, uh, you know, such a big deal was that if anything, just the size of it, uh, you know, so there were other sandwich bots. The sandwich attack I talked about at the beginning, there were several of these uh, bots that were essentially, um, you know, attacked with this thing, and it was literally this map stealing, so basically a proposer went rogue, they tricked the relay in the way I just described, they then got the the sort of unblinded payload that they could turn around, and they could unbundle the bundles, that's why we called it unbundling, and the way that this worked is that to pull off these sandwich attacks, these searchers had to go and expose like a lot of liquidity uh, to even have a profitable trade in the first place. But that's assuming that as a sandwicher, you know, I'm the person who's both front running and back running. What this validator did is they took the sandwiches, took off one half of it, and it replaced themselves. And basically what this meant is they could trick the bot into like being drained completely. That's, ex that's exactly what happened. So this is one transaction from this block that was the attack block. And again, point being is you can see this, this token trade uh, for like 100 bucks worth of Stargate token, the attacker got over $5 million of wrapped ETH. Uh, that's not what the sandwich bot meant to happen, <laughs> I promise you. But uh, this was possible because uh, essentially these bundles that are supposed to be atomic were, were able to be exploited. So, you know, that was fun. The question is like, what's next, right? So we've come to today, we have this relay thing and it's not like maybe perfect. And so then we could think about how to make it better. More broadly, we can say, okay, if we have this off-chain PBS, can we make it somehow, like, can we enshrine it? Can we bring some version of it on-chain and leverage the protocol to like improve some of these pain points that I pointed out? And yeah, like there's definitely a whole like, but yeah, there's a lot of research happening here a lot of R&D across the Ethereum space. There's sort of like uh, immediate, near and like longer term uh, outlooks for, for PBS. So, you know, in the longer term, we again want to go to relays, move to some kind of enshrined PBS. And what that means is taking like this map boost thing I've discussed and kind of mapping it into the protocol somehow. Um, I think the leading sort of design that we have is from Vitalik with this two slot PBS. There's like a one slot variant, two slots. Uh, there's a couple of different ideas here. But basically the idea is take the Mibus construction that we just looked at, uh, drop it directly in the protocol so that you have like a, a bidding slot, then you have a proposing slot. Well, so the proposer would select a bid, uh, then the builder would reveal the next slot. So you have this like two slot thing alternating and that is just going back and forth. Um, next, right, so Barnabé Mano, uh, EF researcher, he's written about this idea called Pepsi. And the idea is, okay, you know, we'll almost certainly need something like PBS long-term. And the question is, if we just take like this Mev boost idea, even this like two slot PBS, which is moving in that direction, if we just take the auction today, like, is that the best we can do? Like, it could be the case that we come up with like a better auction format or like way of thinking about the problem. Uh, and it would not be great if we like ship something, then ultimately uh, realize that we should ship something much better. So the idea with Pepsi is basically just to abstract that away. And say so rather than like have one particular auction, just make it programmable in the same way that we have smart contracts that are programmable. And um, yeah, super cool. Uh, there's some links here to ETH research, which go into the ideas if you want to learn more. Point being, yeah, there's a lot of open sort of questions here, uh, a lot of exciting R&D on the way. Looking a little bit closer, uh, near term for PBS. So yeah, ultimately just want to like harden this thing even with the Chappelle fork last week, or sorry, uh, I guess it just happened. I'm losing track of time. Anyway, uh, with the Chappelle, with the Chappelle fork that just happened, uh, 
I think there were even some like more minor things that happened. And basically, you know, as, as core devs of the protocol, we want to like harden this as much as we can. I think we just have to accept that even though we don't like some of the trade-offs that MevBoost makes today, it's like something we're going to have for like at least a year, if not two or three or five, like, you know, it's not clear how long we'll have this. So we should definitely uh, make it as secure as we can today. Along with that, right, in parallel, we want to have like early expirations of a PBS spec so that we can iterate towards actually putting something into the core protocol. Um, something that's kind of come up in the meantime, actually observing the system being used, is this idea of like latency games. So uh, the way to think about this, uh, we'll just look at this graph on the left here. And basically it's showing like when I have a builder sending a bid, uh, how late into the slot. So like the way the protocol works is it's like sort of cut up into these slots. So there's like the clock of time and it cuts time up into slots, which are 12 seconds. And the question is now, you know, when I have a winning bid, like how late in the slot does it arrive to say the relay or the proposer? Um, and yeah, what this is data is showing is that basically the winning bids are kind of all pushed up against the end of the slot. And the reason this, why this makes sense is because, you know, if I pick the, the highest bid just on value, even just like the marginal transaction, like that one more transaction that would pay me just like a few guay and like priority fee would be enough to outbid someone else, right? All other things being equal. And so what that means now is there's this like arms race as a builder to like gather up all the transactions I can and put them into like the next block that I sent. Uh, so this is happening. It turns out that MEV like latency games like this are really bad because again, they're very centralizing. Uh, but again, interesting to see like the data here. This is something on the right where it's essentially showing the same plot uh, or like the same idea, just like as we go through the slot, how valuable do blocks become? And you can see it kind of just trends straight up. So the question now is if we want to like at least, I mean, yeah, so there's actually a couple of things here, but one way to think about it is we want to make the playing field more even. So like lowering barriers to entry. And one way to do that is basically remove these latency advantages entirely. And there's been a recent line of work called Optimistic Relay, which basically does this. Uh, relays do a couple of things, one of them being validate the bids they get from builders, through like these blocks coming in. And you could imagine basically just trusting the builder to like give you a valid block. Um, it turns out even this like 200 milliseconds of, of validation time is like really important already in, in this game. So uh, yeah, really cool research there. And that's kind of ongoing right now. This was right after they rolled this out on the ultrasound relay. So they've been leading the charge on this work. You can see that like their winning share of, of, uh, of slots here just like shot up. And that was pretty directly just from this one change of rolling out this optimistic idea. So pretty cool to see. And then zooming like way in just like immediately. Um, yeah, this sandwich slipper thing that I discussed, obviously fixing that. But already we're seeing, it's basically pushing like the synchrony assumptions we're making to like their limits, meaning that um, the relays are now just doing even more work to make sure that like this unbundling can't happen. And when they do that, it means that blocks are essentially coming later and later against like these some deadlines we have in the network. And what that means is that if you're too late, then essentially uh, the rest of the protocol, like the rest of the validators, don't see a block for that slot. It's like a missed slot. And that's not good because basically it's like you could have made a block in the chain, but you didn't. Um, so that like, you know, is, is bad for everyone, honestly. Um, so yeah, there's like some interesting consequences there. Something to look at for sure. Uh, Shanghai just happened, the hard fork. Very exciting. Uh, we have 4.4.4 coming up with like blob space, proto dang sharding, a bunch of words you probably also heard this weekend. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, and there's a bunch of other ideas around like improving this model generally, one of them being like censorship resistance. Uh, so there's like an idea of like inclusion list. Um, yeah, we can hear that more maybe in the questions if you want to hear more, but point being there's, there's a lot of different, uh, ways to think about improving that boost. So, uh, how to contribute, I'll run through this and wrap up. So, uh, there's a lot of ways, honestly. Um, I'll just call some repos if you want to contribute with more like engineering or like uh, research here. So there's slash boss at the top, uh, both MevBoost and the Relay. I've actually started an alternative implementation of like the previous two things uh, in Rust. So if you like Rust, check that out. Uh, there, are, there are specs. So basically like this core interaction, let me go way back. 
this core interaction here between builder and proposer, we have this builder API for it. I mean, honestly, yeah, it's this, uh, okay, I went too far back, but basically it's this blue line here. Like <laughs> the idea is we just have a like minimal API for this interaction. And then what that means is that anything happening really on either side of it, but especially upstream of it can like, is free to do whatever. And you just have to conform to the API and we still get all the benefits. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's in this builder specs repo. that I listed and yeah, so there, there's like, I think a lot we want to do right now. It's essentially just like an API spec. Um, I think there's more we can do around specifying like honest behavior, behavior writing testing uh, from, from that spec. So check that out. Uh, Hive is this like, um, yeah, uh, very impressive, honestly, uh, testing framework, let's say. And for here, we could add in these MEV components. Like they kind of have limited support right now but we could definitely add more and that would let us do like end-to-end -end testing of like this whole stack, which would be really helpful. And yeah, if you want to contribute more on like the research side of things, there's E3 search you've probably heard of. Uh, I called off frontier.tech. So frontier research is like a research group coming up. They uh, are looking at MEV as well. And, you know, just another place outside of flashbots or usual suspects to look at. Uh, there is a MevBoost community call. There's one a week from, well, Thursday. So, next week and yeah there's a link if you want to check that out this is my twitter so dm me if you have more questions i'm happy to like direct you various places if you want to get involved so i know there's a lot but i think i might have time maybe for a few questions and yeah thanks yeah so we do is a short answer um so but there is an important distinction here where a validator can always choose to build locally. So if we assume there's some like altruistic sort of chunk or core of the network, if there is some issue where, so if you think about this, like what's really the worst that could happen if you had this like cartel of builders, well, they could essentially center things, um, which is not good. But uh, if there was like a, again, like an honest or even altruistic uh, set of validators, they would, they could see this. And if they see this, they could basically say, hey, we're just not even gonna touch this network at all. This like my boost network. And then basically, uh, you know, build blocks the way they used to. Um, yeah, I mean, they do today. But also, like, what we're seeing, like, just from the data, right? Like, this thing's very much used. Like, I think the question is, like, how much of the network is altruistic versus just rational, meaning, like, profit maximizing. And, uh, you know, ideally, we wouldn't want to have this assumption that things need to be altruistic or there needs to be this, like, uh, honestly, even honest majority of actors. Oh, well, not even. So, so there's essentially along with the the payload header, you basically just claim, uh, I'll pay you say like half an eighth, or like you know a quarter eighth, something like this. And so then MedBoost looks at all of them and picks right now it picks the highest uh value so like you know if, if you send a bid for like one eth i send a bid for like half an eth you would win um yeah like one thing is actually this value is not really verified at all and we haven't seen this yet but you could imagine a builder like again griefs this mechanism by like just like lying um then we need to like provide payment proofs and that's a whole different thing but yeah exactly yeah, and presumably what's happening is like most builders see about the same set of order flow. And so then there's competition for like about the same thing. If that's the case, then, you know, if all of the searchers in the block will pay, say, again, half an ETH, the builder will say, I'll bid 0.49, right? Like they're just going to take like a minimum amount because they, you know, if they, if they don't, if they take more than, you know, what the market will clear, then they actually lose out on the opportunity because like you would underbid me, for example. Um, and yeah, so as long as there's like many builders in competition, then you'd expect like these spreads to compress. And yeah, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first price, all that. So you could think about like making a more sophisticated auction. And that was like the Pepsi thing I called out was like, what if instead of having a fixed format at all, it was just like completely programmable, very much like account abstraction. Um, but again, I think it's very much a open-ended R&D question right now.
Yeah. Um, you definitely can do this. I mean, like, so like one thing searchers will do is basically, uh, if they need to like, if they start to like do some sort of like MEV strategy to like say extract something, they can basically replace that transaction that would like close out the bundle with like a self transfer. And because of the way like we do like, tr you know, transaction replacements, there's like a way just to like, you know, basically it's the same NOS, but a higher fee. Uh, so you could do this and you just end up with like a self send, which basically does nothing except you just pay like the base fee to like do that. Um, but the reason why is because then you like, if you didn't do that, then you would end up executing your strategy, which would have cost you a lot more. Um, so yeah, there's like cancellations and stuff like this where things like that could happen. Um, yeah, you could imagine there could be some situation where someone like, yeah, bids irrationally for some reason to like take up the block space. There's one over here. Definitely, yeah. So I think because there are relatively even fewer like searchers and builders compared to like builders to validators, it's like even more sort of like a trust like reputation thing. Like if it came out that like a builder was like stealing MEV from searchers, like the searchers would all like stop using them immediately. Um, but that being said, you know, like again, sort of like the the ideal thing here is where you actually have like, um, you know, you'd kind of want communication from each step encrypted in some way where like you're revealing enough information that you can still like proceed with like whatever auction you have, but it still is protecting like privacy of like the, you know, engaging actors. Um, so like to say it a different way, like, uh, you know, what I want as a user is the ability for someone to back run me to like do this thing where they, you know, ultimately pay me for the trade, but I don't want them to know the full trade because otherwise they would just front run me, right? Um, so then now you can think of like ways to like reduce or like change like the trust assumptions here to get to that. Um, most of those require like more advanced cryptography than like we have today. But uh, yeah, that's just what makes it interesting R&D exercise. Yeah, so that's kind of what I was just touching on where Ultimately, like a lot of why this happens today is because like transactions happen in clear text. And so like as a searcher, like if I went to like, you know, if, if I have like too much slippage on my trade, then like as a searcher, I could come and basically like, uh, you know, that's that's value I'm, I'm leaking from my trade. And so one way to get around this is well, rather than someone front, front run me to collect that value, I somehow encrypt my transaction and my trade so that, uh, you know, basically they just wouldn't know how to do this in the first place. So they just actually can't. And that's the idea there. So then that would add like kind of more pathways to that big like supply chain graph thing I had, um, where now you have like layers of encryption to protect trades, yeah, swaps, all sorts of things. Okay, well, thanks everyone. We'll go ahead and wrap up.